Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, the first thing I would say is I would ask everyone to turn off any electrical devices that might interfere with the work of the committee or turn them to silent. Um, thank you. The first item is a decision by the committee to take item three in private. Are we all agreed to do that? Yes. Thank you. Now, this morning we have uh, a number of guests with us from the energy sector, and uh, we're do doing this this morning in the form of a, a round table format, so to speak. The, uh, we're interested to hear as much as possible as committee members from the witnesses who are present today. And I would simply ask if anyone wants to come in to speak, if they simply raise their hand so that I can see that you want to come in to speak, and I will come to you um, as soon as we can. There's no need to switch on microphones. That's being dealt with uh, by the, the sound uh, broadcasting, I think, rather than sound desk is what they're called. What I would do to start off is I would invite all of our guests who are here to simply introduce themselves, tell us their name and the organization very briefly. And I'll start, first of all, with um, Kirsty to my right. Okay. So I'm Kirsty Berg. I work for Ofgem, the uh, UK energy regulator for the gas and electricity industry. I've got two roles at Ofgem. I'm head of our office in, in Scotland, and I'm also the partner for the regulated networks. I'm the Director of Communications at Scottish Renewables, and Scottish Renewables is a, a trade association representing renewable energy companies in Scotland. Uh, Malcolm Kay, Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, which, as the name suggests, looks at energy issues. My concerns are the interaction, really, between energy and climate change policy. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Leighton. I'm here representing the Existing Homes Alliance. Where I'm the policy advisor. It's a uh, coalition of housing, environmental and poverty groups um, arguing for greater investment in our housing stock for, to address fuel poverty and climate change challenges. I also wear another hat um, where I'm giving policy advice to the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, which will be making recommendations on a new fuel poverty strategy in the next few months. Elizabeth Gore, I'm Deputy Director at Energy Action Scotland, which is the National Fuel Poverty Charity, so our focus is on people who can't afford to heat their homes. I'm Mark Winskill, I'm a researcher at the University of Edinburgh, I also work for the UK Energy Research Centre and for Climate Exchange, which is the Scottish Government funded uh, National Centre for Expertise on Climate Change. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mike Tolan. I'm uh, Head of Upstream Policy at Oil & Gas UK, the trade association which represents uh, the interests of the oil industry and the gas industry here in Scotland, thinking both of the supply chain and indeed the producer community. Hi, I'm Stuart Noble, uh, Head of Markets in Scotland Policy for Scottish Power. We welcome the opportunity to be part of the committee's proceedings today and working with them over the next five years. We have an interest across the energy chain in both, in, sorry, in networks, uh, generation and retail. Um, and as part of Ebadrola, we're one of the world leaders in renewable energy. Thank you. And uh, immediately to my left, we have um, the official reporters and also a representative of SPICE and uh, two of the parliamentary clerks. Um, perhaps I could um, start with a question and uh, I'll simply put this out and ask which of our guests would like to respond to it. I think in a previous session I directed a question to someone who said that someone else would be better placed to answer it, which was a, a fair, fair response. In this case, I'll um, simply put that back to our guests and see who would like to come in and comment on it. Um, if we're talking about decarbonisation, uh, a huge amount of our difficulty in Scotland is with carbon emissions and old cities like Edinburgh with bottleneck roads such as St John's Road and Christorphan or other routes into the city uh, through Balerno and Curry and so forth. We have huge problems with uh, carbon emissions from transport. How, how do our guests feel this can be addressed? And one issue in particular that comes to my mind is the lack of integrated ticketing for public transport systems, which would be taken as a given in, in many European countries. Is, is there 
a way in which in Scotland we can start to address these issues and organize ourselves better. Who would like to come in on that? No one. <laughs> right, thank you. We do, do have a take. Malcolm Kay. Well, can I start if no one else wants to start? I mean, I think that uh, certainly in the short, short run, doing things about public transport and issues like integrated ticketing are going to be very important. But it's also going to be absolutely vital to think about the longer run and what sort of vehicle fleet you've got and what role electric vehicles will play. And I think a lot of experience in transport studies worldwide suggests that you have to do an awful lot of this through regulation. You have to regulate what sort of vehicles can access city centres. Uh, the congestion charge is one example of that, but you may have um, uh, congestion charges with special exemptions for electric vehicles, say, but you may have to increase the nature of the regulation um, so there's only certain sorts of vehicles that can access the centre. And I think that um, this is one area where pure reliance on market forces probably doesn't work and where you have to have a fairly coherent long-term regulatory strategy. Uh, there is a limit to what you can do with the actual geography of existing cities. And in a city like Edinburgh, there's a limit to what you want to do. You don't want to start knocking down lots of Edinburgh. So you have to live with that. And therefore, as I say, I think you have to go for an approach which has a, a longer-term, low-carbon transport system in mind and to a large extent regulates its way there. You mean with regard to both public and private transport? Yes. I mean, it means developing the public transport in an integrated fashion, as you say, um, so that there are alternatives, and then, to a fair extent, limiting the extent to which private uh, road vehicle transport can have access to towns in particular and to certain areas of towns. Meanwhile, at, at a Scottish level and at a UK level, encouraging the development of low-carbon vehicles, probably electric vehicles, and the sorts of infrastructure which is needed to... Um, support them. These, th the nature of road transport is it's very much um, chicken and egg. I mean, you, you, you have a certain sort of car because you know there will be a filling station, you know, a certain way down the road. A new, to for an entirely new sort of uh, vehicle powering to come into the system does, as I say, require regulation. If you look at examples like Brazil and South Africa, which were actually quite effective in um, introducing alcohol vehicles to the extent that now in Brazil it's more or less self-sustaining. The first steps in this have to be taken by very strong government action because people are tied into a system at the moment and moving them off that is quite difficult. And, and is it economically feasible to approach these things in the way you suggest? Provided you use a combination of measures including public transport, I think the question is rather whether it's politically feasible. If you start regulating and telling people that they can't drive into towns or park in towns in certain situations, which has much the same effect, uh, it is politically difficult. So I think the problem is a political one as much as an economic one. Gillian right. um, Martin. Yeah, um, I'm going to go off, off topic. It's not off the back of... It's, it's more to do with um, the issues around uh, the choice that's there for consumers. And in particular, in rural areas, there are issues around um, people being disadvantaged because they often only have one option when it comes to heating their homes. Um, from Aberdeenshire East, and for a lot of people, that's oil-fired central heating because there's no infrastructure in terms of being access to gas. And off the back of that as well, um, when we're talking about renewable energies, um, pricing people's lower incomes out of this... Uh, pricing them out of having the advantages of having things like solar energy panels put in their homes because the outlay is too high. So I'm wondering what the, the panel might think about those two issues. Um, Elizabeth Gore. Certainly the, the, the issue of um, everybody across the country having equal access to a choice of fuels and how to heat their homes and indeed the ability at all to heat their homes to an adequate level is, is quite a big issue that is being discussed in 
both fuel poverty fields and energy efficiency fields in general. And uh, uh, quite a lot of the focus in terms of looking at energy efficiency programmes just now is how to make the programmes and the measures that um, are delivered as part of those programmes to improve people's homes, how can, that can be um, more fairly distributed across the country, particularly in rural areas, particularly in rural remote areas. Um, being off the gas network at the moment is, is a disadvantage in terms of being able to heat your home. Um, access to, to renewables um, tends to be for most people through government grants, but they tend to be for people who can probably afford it to a certain extent themselves. And I think um, fuel poverty programmes such as the current um, area-based scheme, which is run through local authorities, is one way where um, perhaps more people can be opened up to the possibilities of, of, of a range of technologies um, where that can be, can be funded through government, but it's, it's open to people who are in a particular area, maybe where they need help the most. And, and that way, also through social housing providers, um, perhaps then the technologies through, through wider use can come down in price as well. So there's, there's, there's a range of, of mechanisms that need to be put into place, but sustained. It's quite an expensive way to, to improve houses, but the improvements that they provide make it worthwhile. Um, I think Elizabeth Leighton would like to come in and then Rachel Money. Uh, yes, I've, I'll, I'll build on what Elizabeth's been saying. I think um, coming at this from uh, an infrastructure entry point is, is a very good one because we know that the government and indeed um, there's cross-party support for the commitment to make energy efficiency of all buildings in Scotland a national infrastructure priority, which in our view should mean you know, a real step change in ambition of this, this vision that we see in terms of our buildings being low carbon um, and also a step change in investment. And I think from our point of view, for addressing the concerns of the fuel poor and, and access to some of these technologies, that those who are not able to pay shouldn't have to pay. They shouldn't have to go into debt to live a low carbon and affordable, um, affordable to heat lifestyle. And so there should be grants made available to those people and, and no longer should the energy performance of your property be a reason to be in fuel poverty. There's no reason we have the technology, we have the ability to raise the standards of our homes to a much higher level. And you know we've um, produced a briefing that um, I believe many of you have seen, but you know with a sign up of some 50 organizations that have agreed with us that you know nobody in Scotland should be living in a hard to heat drafty home by 2025. And we said that should be a, a C rating on the EPC band, if not higher. Um, and that would virtually eliminate energy efficiency, energy performance of your property as a reason to be in fuel poverty, and that's really important. On solar, there are many examples of how housing associations, to meet the regulatory standard, have used solar panels um, as, as a means to raise the standard of the homes, to get people on cheaper energy tariffs or using energy at different times when it's cheaper. I know in Stirling Council has, will expect to get all their properties up to a B rating, which is fantastic. You know, so none of this, we can't do it. It, it, it can be done. And there's a link to transport, of course, because if we're looking at this future energy system where we're, you know, we're tying up all our energy uses and we can you know, fix that problem of energy storage, you're looking at you know, plugging in your electric vehicle, you know, using that energy that you're not using during the day never, and, store, and um, charging up your car so that you can use that later on. But you know, an integrated system, is, that's what is the future. Um, so that brings in accessibility again for rural areas. And I think Rachel Money want to come in, and then perhaps Gillian will want to come back on that. I think there's there's definitely quite a clear point to be made about renewable heat. At the moment, we have a target of sourcing 11% of our heat from uh, renewable heat by 2020, um, and currently we stand at about 3.8% against that 11% target. 
So I think, as, as what's already been said, there's a real case here for raising public awareness of what kinds of um, tools that are there available to them to ensure that their homes um, are not only energy efficient, but that they're using the cheapest form of, of renewable heat um, and heat sources that they can. So I think we also need to do a bit more in terms of public awareness raising, but also not just think about domestic homes, but also think about our, our public buildings as well. Um, Scottish Renewables did a Freedom of Information request not so long ago looking at the amount of renewable heat that had been installed within our public buildings. And whilst there's a little bit of work going on, I think there was about 1% of local authorities came back to say that they were using um, renewable heat sources, which is a good start. It's at least something. But I think how we can um, help local authorities and public buildings actually ensure that they're leading by example as well in using a lot of the technologies and a lot of the energy efficiency measures that we, we talk about within the domestic setting, actually think about how we can do that across the, the public buildings themselves. Thank Kirsty Berg. Yeah, br briefly to touch on um, access to the, to the gas networks, because we've talked about renewables, but, but less about that, that point. So we recognise that can, can for fuel poor um, consumers um, be an issue. What, one of the things we did for the current price control um, for the, the distribution companies was to incentivise them to extend the gas network to fuel poor consumers um, and we will be seeing at least 17,000 fuel poor households in, in Scotland connect to the, the networks as, as part of that. I think Gillian did you want to come back in yeah, on this or perhaps I'm perhaps um, yeah Malcolm Kay. Yeah. Uh, can I just make a bit of a plea for joined up government here that um, I'm a bit worried about talking about renewable heat in isolation. We were talking earlier today about the need for an overall heat strategy. Um, now, one of the reasons why renewable heat has come into problem is it's very difficult to get renewable heat in an environmentally acceptable way. Um, I think any, any form of um, promoting particular forms of heat should be in the context of a wider strategy for what we want to do in terms of heating houses in a decarbonised way. And to a certain extent, the same applies to installing energy efficiency measures. I know they are generally good, so to speak, for decarbonisation. But if you are going to do some work in a house, should it not be in the context of a heat strategy? So you are redesigning that house in the context of your low carbon heat strategy with whatever form of heating the government has decided or the market has decided is the best form for that strategy. The difficulty with having particular sets of policy options to being developed in isolation, renewable heat here and energy efficiency here is, you can end up with all sorts of disparate measures um, which won't in the long run uh, deliver you an, uh, an efficient low carbon heat system. I think um, Stuart Noble, did you have... I was just going to come in and uh, on, you know, energy efficiency, uh, you know, energy efficiency obligations, well-designed ones, are, are a way of tackling fuel po poverty as well. And uh, with the devolved powers uh, to the Scottish government and, and the ability to influence some of the design there, um, that could he help to tackle f fuel poor as well. And and you have a range of measures that you're thinking of uh, that Malcolm Kay has just. Uh, n not at the moment, uh, not, not, not off the top of my head, but as I say, we look forward to, to um, you know, th th there are differences in the housing stock in, in Scotland than there are in across the UK, um, solid walls installations, etc., that, that are beneficial to uh, Scotland particularly. Um, Elizabeth Gore? Just, just on the, the topic of, of carbon and heat and fuel poverty, the, you know, these issues are not mutually exclusive. You know, there are overlaps and, and working on them, it's, you know, there's, there's a, cr a cross fertilization, if you like. But I think it is important to take up the point that's been made about making sure that at some level, um, the government in particular is, is looking to make sure that targets are not being addressed in isolation. Because, for example, in the energy company obligation the, on the suppliers at, at the moment, which is, is currently going through the process through the Scotland Act of being devolved to Scotland, um, there, ha there have been instances where, through the best will, but th there have been instances where um, measures have not been delivered to a household because they don't deliver the carbon savings but actually they would have made a great deal of difference to the person living in that house. 
So we, we have to have rules to the programmes, we have to have targets, but we need to make sure that we're not cutting off our nose to spite our face and, and making sure that these targets are joined up. Um, Elizabeth Leighton. Uh, yes, uh, just briefly on the point about joining up, we, we are in a very fortunate position that there is this commitment to the national infrastructure priority and the foundation program for that and indeed a, a key part of the forthcoming energy strategy is going to be Scotland's energy efficiency program, see, which does indeed join up heat um, and renew buildings, renewables and energy efficiency, recognizing the interplay between all of those technologies and solutions and recognizing, you know, you have to deal with the needs of the, the family, you know, what their needs are in terms of energy or needs of the business, and it's bringing, and it's pulling together domestic and non-domestic. So there's, there's huge potential there, but it, I very much, you know, I'm pleased that the committee is, is looking at this issue because it will rely on, you know, people like yourselves to hold the government to account that they are going to meet that commitment in terms of achieving those, those targets on um, making sure the climate change targets, the fuel poverty targets, and indeed it's designed in a way that we're maximizing the economic benefits and the health benefits that, that can come out of a program like that. Thank you. Um, Gillian, did you want to come back on any of these Happy points? To give the in that, someone else. Thank you. In that case, John Mason and then Jackie Bailey. Okay, uh, well, a different subject. I mean, I'm interested, it, it just seems to me every time we talk about energy, and especially renewables, that storage of energy and storage of electricity is kind of high in the agenda. And uh, am I right in thinking that that is a real bottleneck, uh, either at the kind of national Kruachan saving, storing the country's electricity, or as was mentioned for a car, how much we can put in a, a car battery, because I want to drive a bit further than 90 miles before I, I need to kind of recharge. So, you know, can, can folk give me a steer as to, you know, are we at the boundaries of science and we need to wait for the scientists to do more or is it just expensive and we need to get the cost down? I mean, I don't even know. If, if, if we pump water up Kruachan and then we had to depend on it to supply us with electricity, I mean, how many hours would it actually supply us with? At the moment, it would run for at least seven hours, depending on what was in the dam at the time. Um, Kruken is obviously, in terms of the technology challenge, Kruken has done that job for years and many years, um, nearly, well, over 50 years, I think, that it had its um, birthday the other day. Um, so the other thing I meant to ask too was, how efficient is it? I mean, how much of the electricity do you get back down compared um, to what you've put up? The, the cycle's around about 80% efficient. Right. Um, but it, it also benefits from some runoff as well. So it is in itself a hydro station and not just a pump storage station. Uh, so we've got the ability there uh, to expand Kruken, um, double its capacity and or add um, more storage in terms of the dam height at Kruken. And that's a potential project that uh, Scottish Power are looking at. It. Um, I think uh, in terms of your, your, your question about technology, I think some of the batteries and the battery progress, some of that is probably more suited to very short runs when compared to a pump storage technology. It's just the way that the, the uh, technology costs come out. Um, but certainly there are some wider benefits for the system in terms of pump storage hydro, in terms of if it's on, it's providing inertia. Uh, um, which is basically helps the quality of the system in terms of the intermittent generation going going on. Um, batteries can produce that instantly, but inertia is one thing, and maybe Kirsty might want to come on it, in on it, that the system requires to stay stable. Um, <coughs> we would like to bring um, pump storage to the market. Um, we have been working with Scottish Renewables on, on a report that will be published in the near future around the barriers that may be preventing that. Um, we feel that if some of the risks can be mitigated, because um, it's a big infrastructure project, um, it does have relatively high upfront capital costs, and um, it has a long construction period as well, uh, around about four or five years. But um, if there are, is some kind of risk mitigation scheme in place, we're not asking for a subsidy, but if there is some form of risk mitigation scheme into place, similar perhaps to the mechanisms that are applied to our interconnectors, uh, we. we we believe that that could unlock the potential in Scotland, not only at the site at Kruken, but SSE have a potential project at Coyer Glass as well. 
spiritual money, I think, wanted I to come in. I was actually just going to pick up on that point that Stuart made, that there is ongoing work in terms of stor- um, hydro pump storage. And as he said, we're, we are working on a paper that hopefully will bottom out what those barriers are to, to delivering these projects in Scotland, but also hopefully quantify the, the potential savings that that might bring to the consumer as an end result. Um, I think in terms of batteries, there is such a huge plethora in terms of the types of technology, and it's exactly as you just said. Sometimes in order to bring down the costs of those, that, those types of technologies, you need to innovate, you need to see it working, you need to learn, you need to adapt, and then that's how technology costs come down, is you're actually you're building it and you're producing it. And do, and do we leave that to the private sector, or should we as the parliament and government be doing something about that? I think at the moment for Scottish Renewables, certainly... This is a very new sector for us. We are still trying to map out where the supply chain is in Scotland, what's happening in Scotland. I think in the last few days you probably have seen um, some news from uh, GIA who are putting on some uh, a, a storage battery to help support three onshore wind turbines. Because of course, for an island community, that's absolutely essential. So th- there is there is work um, going on, but I think it, for for Scottish renewables, it, it it's so new. It's such a new. Uh, technology for us but we do know that we absolutely need it as, as first day talked about this morning where you do have a variability on the in terms of generation storage just it's essential and we need to see it come through we need to see it supported Malcolm Kay and then Kirsty Berg uh, thanks can I just reinforce the point about battery storage I think in, in relation to your initial question it's very close to being competitive now in many situations recently in Southern California Tesla has sold quite a large battery array for Southern California as an alternative to a gas, a CCGT, a gas turbine, um, to provide system support. Um, We are very close to the point, and of course the significance of batteries is that they're relatively scalable. They certainly fit in with the image of a very dispersed, small-scale system. There are, however, some... I, mean, I, th- I think it requires some government support, but I think, um, and off Jim may wish to comment, there are some regulatory barriers to use of battery storage. For instance, there are a number of um, solar um, generators I- in the UK which could easily build battery storage and provide more <coughs> services to the system by spreading their uh, output throughout the day. There's no benefit to them from that. They get paid their feed-in tariff for what they export. Um, so they wouldn't get any extra benefit from it. Similarly, for a consumer, if you built battery storage um, or if you in, uh, installed your own battery storage and um, relieved some peaks on the system, there's no particular benefit from you in the price, uh, pricing structures they are just now. So um, it's partly a matter of government support, but to a large extent it's a matter of a, a better incentives within the system for people to install storage, um, whether it's a generator like the solar generator I've mentioned or, or an individual um, and once the incentives are there, I, I feel the market is likely to develop very, very quickly because it has developed so fast, fast in the past few years and it's going to get to a level which um, would almost certainly be economic uh, with any other alternative. We can't prove that just now, but the first step, I think, would be to remove the regulatory barriers and, <laughs> and see what happens. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just the, the central point is there's potentially a huge role for storage um, in, the, in the energy system. And it's it's worth just remembering that it can be at different levels in the system. So it could it can be large batteries potentially connected to the transmission system, so really big stuff. There's sort of intermediate um, storage um, which can be used on the distribution network. And it can also be storage in people's houses, so batteries. We already have that. If you've got, you know, if you've got solar panel, it's usually a- attached to a battery, so we already have it in households. So at all of these levels, um, storage has the, the potential to to play um, a, a big role. Um, just picking up on on some of the, I, I mean, some of the issues are, are clearly for government. Where do you, what what type of storage do you want to see, and where do you want to support innovation? That that is a decision for for government in the same way as you might want to support particular types of, of generators. But but you you are right. We are aware that there are some regulatory barriers for for full development of storage and. These are some of the things we are working on in our flexibility work. So, so what, one example is how storage is charged, how, how it pays for using the network, because it, it, in some sense it's a consumer when it takes electricity off the network, and then it's a producer when it puts it on. But it performs a very 
important service. So we want to make sure that where it is the case, it isn't charged twice, and that it is it's actually it's reflected how it's the, the contribution it makes to the system and, and the way in which it uses the network. Another example is we haven't talked much about this, but but smart meters. So smart meters should be rolled out to all households um, by by 2021. Um, and just to pick up Malcolm's point, one of the things you're saying it's important to get the pricing structure right. Now, with the rollout of smart meters, you will be able to measure exactly what consumers are using at any point in time, and consumers can have control over exactly when they use electricity. Um, we, we need to, the, the industry needs to do some back office work to make sure that this all works properly so half hourly settlements a bit of a boring topic but just making sure that that you're actually measuring and settling for the exact half hour in which somebody is using energy will contribute to an, an efficient flexible system so what you can do is you can make sure you don't use lots of energy at peak when it is very expensive and that will be reflected in the price um, which you pay for that and we need to make sure, and we're working with industry, that we are ready to, to get these full benefits of, of, of smart metering, which you know, works, can work very well together with, with domestic storage, for example. Right. There are a number of members of the committee who would like to come in with questions. Perhaps I could just ask if any of them have a question about the, the issue of storage of energy, which uh, John Mason has just raised, or if we're moving on to uh, a new topic, perhaps. Um, Gil, I just wanted. To, I've got <laughs> practically practically the full answer from from Malcolm earlier on. But back to transport. I mean, in one hand you're asking for regulation and deregulation, but if we stick strictly to transport, does the does the step change take place by regulating, and then the investment comes after from 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 the private sector? Well, I think you have to do a combination. They have to move in parallel with each other. You can't regulate people out of city centres without providing them with other ways of getting into city centres, obviously. You have to improve your public transport at the same time you regulate your private transport. I think a lot of the response comes from the regulation, though. You may know that in Norway at the moment, something like 30 to 40 percent of new vehicles are electric because they have a lot of excellent incentives for new vehicles to be electric um, and it's a very attractive option and they you know they include things like no congestion charges but also free ferry services subsidies in the new vehicles and so on um, and that market has developed as it develops then the infrastructure I've spoken about tends to develop along with it so I think you can do them easily in parallel with each other but you do need to have a a clear sense of direction as to which way you're going. Otherwise, to get round this infrastructure problem of building all the necessary service stations and so on is quite difficult. Thank you. I think Jackie Bailey, you had a... I wonder, convenient, can I just pick up on the point about smart meters? Um, because I think the technology is wonderful. I'm pleased to hear you're working with industry. Um, I am terrified for consumers, though because you know, the, some people will take to this like a duck to water, but we already know that a lot of consumers in fuel poverty just aren't going to take to smart meters. They're not the ones switching. Um, so I have fears about whether there's any work being done directly with consumers so that they understand the technology. Um, my wider point is about affordability. Um, I hear from members of the panel that we have the technology. It's very exciting. It's not the cheapest technology necessarily. Um, so I'm wondering who pays for all of this. Is it the taxpayer? Is it the consumer? And it's one thing to say, as Ofgem did earlier, that you know we will we will deal with issues of affordability. Can I just make the observation um, 15 years we've waited for prepayment meters to be capped. I think we need a bit more progress on this issue um, a bit quicker. Would someone like to come back in on that? Um, Elizabeth, oh, sorry, we'll take Dr. Winskill first of all. Yeah, I, so I think this is a really important point. Um, I, and I do think there's a bit of a temptation sometimes to think that we have the same kind of level of uh, um, um, sort of wealth as, as Norway, for example. So there's a lot of subsidy going on behind that Norway story on, on um, electric vehicles and so on. So I think we have to apply this kind of um, affordability test right across all of these policies. 
whether it's supply, networks, or, or demand and efficiency. And demand and efficiency sounds like an absolute kind of no-brainer, and in some ways, there is an awful lot of work to do. So the question is, you know, how far to push, um, how hard to push on these policies over a sort, sort of the next few years, and how much of it should be a more gradual rollout and trying to learn from some of the demonstrations. So there is a lot of uncertainty in this. I think, I think, um, yeah, the national infrastructure priority is a, is, a, is a very welcome move on energy efficiency. There are questions about the whole housing stock getting up to, to band C and the costs involved there. I've seen some of the, the figures that Elizabeth and the group have produced, and they do, you know, it becomes quite an expensive, um, you know, you, uh, uh, the sort of the mass housing stock being converted up to great band C is, 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 has, a, has a, a large kind of bill associated with it. So we have to think about that, how, how fast we can actually achieve that. Uh, I think on some of these areas we're, we're, in, uh, we're in the domain of kind of uh, working out what's the cheapest option. I don't think we know that for heat particularly. I think we know efficiency, conservation makes a lot of sense under any scenario. So that's a question of how, how far to go, how quickly in terms of regulation and, and the costs associated with that. I think with heat, we're still, I'm still seeing lots of different evidence about uh, renewable heat and low carbon heat and it's coming forwards with very different kind of um, mixes for the future, different technologies. So we don't really know the answer to that one. And I think it'd be wrong for us to say that we do. Anyone who suggests that there is a, there is a kind of a consensus around the heat problem at the moment, it, 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 that, it, that isn't the balance of evidence as I understand it. So I think intelligent kind of uh, policy for this is a bit more about uh, demonstration and testing and, and making sure uh, the things that uh, Ofgem have been uh, sponsoring, for example, on the, on the distribution networks, that kind of knowledge is being built into future uh, deployment. So it's not, it's not uh, a case of we know what the solution is for, for many of these areas. And we have to kind of go gradually in some areas. I think the problem is that we've got very specific targets for like the renewable heat thing. The government have been pushed very hard on that because there is a, there is a specific target for renewable heat. It's a very difficult one. Uh, because there aren't affordable solutions and, you know, the, gas, the off-gas grid is, is very difficult there. So I, I think it's a, it's a very important concern that you've registered and I think we just have to apply that as a kind of a sense test on, on lots of these different solutions as they mentioned. Is it a question of balance in terms of affordability? Um, I, I think we know, uh, so the, the, the level of kind of uh, what we know uh, about this differs across different parts of the problem. So we know... Uh, you know, we can get the costs of uh, wind, wind down greatly. There's been a lot of achievement there. Uh, there's been much more problems elsewhere. Um, so I don't think there's a universal kind of uh, single answer to this. But I, I think uh, what I sense is that there's quite a lot of um, sort of ambition in the policy, which isn't necessarily kind of um, uh, reflected in sort of least cost solutions. So we, I think we have to be careful about sort of, uh, um, what, so the Scottish government are very committed to localization as, as one of the strands of the energy strategy. Now there's a lot happening on the lo lo localization and decentralization front, but the suggestion that we kind of go for kind of uh, uh, city scale uh, solutions for energy balancing universally, I think that's far ahead of where we are. So there's a the danger of kind of introducing extra cost to, in the system just by um, not recognizing that a lot of this is still at the innovation stage. And we're not, we don't quite know what those innovation trials are telling us yet in and, and terms of the cost, cost and the cost reduction. So there's a, there is a danger there. Thank you. Elizabeth Gore. I just wanted to pick up on a point that Jackie Bailey made about um, providing um, energy advice support to, to consumers. This is not a new issue, but with the rollout of smart meters, it is, it's crucial. Um, the, the rollout of smart meters is, is a huge operation. It's, it's going to cost a lot. Obviously, there are benefits to, to having smart meters, but unless we have a, a really good program of advice that goes along with that to, to customers, about how to get the benefit from their smart meter on an ongoing basis after they've got the over the initial point of you know this is this is something new that we've got, um, then we're going to miss a huge opportunity to tap into consumer behaviour in terms of their energy use, um, and that can range from a leaflet 
to telephone advice, but also to face-to-face -face advice, and it needs to be available across the country. Thank you. Um, I think Kirsty Berg wanted to come in. I also want to come back uh, directly to your question about on, on smart meters because you know we're talking about this wonderful futuristic world where we're all controlling our smart meters from our well they won't be iPhones at that point um, which is all great for those who can sort of grab the technology frontier but there you know there will be a large number of, of vulnerable consumers who are who are not able to do that and we need to make sure that they are are protected as, as, as part of that and like Elizabeth says it's it's going to be very important that consumers get the help and advice and um, they need to to be able to use the smart meters that there are there are some direct benefits of, of smart meters to, to vulnerable consumers so cur um, currently if you're on ppm and a lot of vulnerable consumers are you actually have to have a special ppm meter whereas with smart meters you can actually switch the f you just have one meter and you can switch the functionality and I think that is one of the, the benefits because you don't have to have a meter installed and if people feel comfortable and I completely accept it will take work to make people feel comfortable and then they, they can change that, that functionality. Um, so you, know, you can move between um, a PPM and another uh, a more regular type of, of, of tariff. Um, I, think, I think that I welcome the CMA's recommendation on a cap on, on PPM. I do think that that helps um, vulnerable consumers on, on PPM. In addition, we have another issue around PPM customers and vulnerable customers on, on PPM was the cost of installing um, a meter under warrant. So if people have had debts for a long time, um, uh, they have to have a PPM meter installed so that they don't run up excessive debts. Now, average costs for that was uh, has been something like £400 to have a meter installed, and we don't think that's right for vulnerable consumers. So we're consulting on capping that at 100 or £150 to, 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 to manage that. Um, we are also, you were working with Citizens Advice Scotland to, to help um, vulnerable consumers engage um, in the energy market. So we're, we're, um, they're delivering sort of one-to-one -one service to, to vulnerable consumers. We're working with frontline workers who, who work with vulnerable consumers. So training them up to help consumers look, look for the best deals. Um, you know, we, we have to have, we, we need to monitor carefully what's going to happen um, as, as we roll out smart meters. I think there will be a number of benefits, but um, vulnerable consumers will need support to make sure they maximize that benefit. Thank you. Um, Malcolm Kay. Can I, can I offer a slightly different take on the affordability issue? Um, I know it's primarily a political question, but there's arguably a case for fiscal rebalancing, that is for taking some of the costs which fall on electricity consumers and putting them into general taxation. There are good wider economic arguments for this. We're dealing with what is essentially a global public good, that is a clean climate. There are good energy strategy arguments for this. If you incorporate all the costs of renewables and so on into electricity, that just pushes up the price of electricity. The wholesale cost of electricity has hardly gone up in the past several years, but the retail price has gone up a lot. That in turn is bad in energy strategy terms, especially if you decide that your idea for um, uh, home heating is about electric heating. Um, it tends to distort the market. Not every country in the world imposes its um, renewables costs via energy prices. It can be done in other ways. For instance, the United States does it mainly through general taxation, through tax allowances. Um, so, and if you look at the way it appears in the national accounts just now, it appears the tax, a tax and spend. It's not something purely internal to the electricity industry. It's part of, as part of national accounts, it's part of a Brit a British public expenditure. So, for, for many reasons, I think it might well be worth reviewing the way in which this particular form of taxation is spread. Obviously, in terms of affordability, if you spread it onto general taxation, that has a great advantage in terms of, uh, you know, the, the distributional consequences. You can put the tax on those who can afford to pay. So, so I know that isn't the way in which it's been done in the UK hitherto, but I think there is quite a strong case for considering at least an element of fiscal rebalancing here. And Elizabeth Leighton. Uh, yes, I was going to respond to the point um, Mark made about the affordability, applying affordability test uh, to upgrading of, of the housing stock and generally for um, transforming our heat provision and I certainly would wholeheartedly agree with that that this the transition to a low carbon um, energy structure can't be done on the backs of those who are least able to pay for it um, on the contrary those are the people who most need 
passive houses that you know don't don't require any kind of energy so, um, heating source or um, or uh, another solution is something called energy sprong, which is a um, a Dutch approach to refurbing houses where they come in and you're gonna roll into your street and uh, refurbish or retrofit the homes up to a, you know almost like an A rating in a week and then they're gone again and you know there are those solutions that are possible and different methods of paying for it so that it's not not on their on their backs um, but we also have to look at those who are able to pay is how can we encourage them to invest in their homes and value energy efficiency in their properties and so we've argued for the introduction of of regulation fair regulation that would be associated with incentives to assist compliance so that we can gradually bring the private housing sector up up to scratch and closer to where the social sector um, is now because at the moment say in the social sector you've got um, something like if you're in an a or uh, very high rated house you've got 19 percent of um, people living in fuel poverty in the social sector, but in the private rented sector, 79%. You know, so it's a big difference between the two sectors, and it's time now to bring that private housing sector up to scratch. Thank you. Um, Stuart Noble want to come in, and then we'll move on to a question from Ash Denham. Yeah, Kirsty did cover most of my points in the PPM meters, actually, but we do also um, participate in the voluntary scheme um, of transferring uh, PPM customers uh, with some of their debt. It's not open to all customers, but we are seeing um, some customers transfer from there as well, so they can take the debt, debt with them. We, we currently offer two, two tariffs on our PPM meters. On a different subject, can I just ask a couple of questions about affordability? Yes, um, some of my questions have been uh, touched upon. Malcolm certainly did. I, I was wanting to know three things. Uh, how do we achieve a low carbon future without adversely in impacting on consumers? Secondly, is there technology available that would reduce, reduce consumers' energy bills and potentially remove them from being dependent on energy networks? Um, but, and my third point is um, in relation to Ofgem's comments about protecting vulnerable uh, consumers. Um, the Committee on Climate Change, um, when they looked at this back in 2014, said that household bills had increased by 75% between 2004 and 2013, when there was a general price inflation of only 23%. And bearing in mind what's happened with Hinkley Point, which they're suggesting will add consumer bills of additional £230 to electricity bills a year on average, is off gem failing to protect vulnerable consumers? Kirsty, do you want to... Uh Yep, shall I, shall, I, shall I start with the last one first? So, so this goes back to the, well, I suppose the question of what, what is our role versus what is the government's role. So, so the government's role is, is very much to, um, to decide what kind of generation it needs and where that generation can't be provided by the market, um, provide the mechanisms to support that. So for example, the, the, the government's programme for um, uh, incentivising the right kind of generation to meet um, security of supply and our low carbon targets is called the electricity market reform and there is a couple of aspects to that one is a um, capacity market but another is the decision on whether to on supporting nuclear um, generation we have no role in that we, we regulate the, the networks the monopoly networks and ensure that there's co there's competition um, in, in the retail market so so that's a that's I think you know, what, what kind of generation you support and at what cost, I think that's that's a, a question for, for government. Um, I wonder, is, so what your, what were your other... How, how do we make um, households independent um, of... That's right, yep, yep. That, 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 that's, energy networks. Yep. That's, that's a very good question. Um, well, I suppose the starting point is, do you want households to be independent of electricity networks. One of the things we don't want to happen is just for um, the network companies to build lots of networks, that we want them to think hard about what networks are actually going to be needed and what, what is need going to be used. Um, we talked about storage earlier. So if you have a world where um, you know, you've got great storage coupled with intermittent generation locally, then 
there's obviously less, less need for, for networks. But where we are now, even for local networks, quite often people actually want to be connected to the distribution network or the transmission network for the days when um, the wind doesn't blow, occasionally when the sun doesn't shine in Scotland, you may want to, to you know, make sure you've got access elsewhere. So it's, it's, we, we do want to look at, and, and there's a, you know, we, we do want to minimise costs and one of one of the key ways in which we are trying to incentivize the network companies to do that is through getting them to manage their network a bit more innovative using battery storage so that means you know if they do that you don't have to transport more over the transmission system likewise in the future we may move to you know households managing a bit more themselves which means we need less network costs but we're not we're not quite there yet but it's it is probably a direction of travel right uh, ash denham did you have a question on the Following in from that. So we've touched on already this morning about the Scottish Government's plan, obviously, to move um, to get more heat demand to come from renewable sources. But we know that the uptake in this area has been quite slow. And one of the quotes that um, we've got in the notes here is that um, district heating, there's an instinctive dislike of it in the UK. So I'm wondering if some of the people here would maybe explain um, what that you know, district heating would look like in a, in a Scandinavian country and what the benefits would be. And then I suppose the question is, um, at the policy level, should the Scottish Government be asking, you know, if you're building a new housing estate, that maybe we should be, you know, incentivising them to be relying on district heating in, in those scenarios or not? You possibly want to come back in on the previous point, and I wonder if you might want to um, comment also on the question that's just been posed. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I think so. I think we have to ask. Par partly, we have to start from what do we do well at the moment in the UK energy system, and uh, so I'll try and wrap that up. So, what we have at the moment is a kind of a, 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 a sort of national systems for heat, which we call gas and electricity, um, transmission and distribution, that have evolved over a long time. And we've got lots of kind of expertise on that. So we have, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of supply chain for uh, domestic gas boilers in the world is, is in the UK. Um, we also kind of socialise our costs across the GB grid. So lots of the kind of remo more re remoter parts of the grid get their access to the grid subsidised through a kind of, you know, uh, a GB-wide system of, of payments and subsidies and network access. Um, on... On heat, the evidence is that people like their gas boilers a lot, right? So people are pretty content with, they don't like paying uh, the kind of uh, uh, increase in bills that, that Malcolm uh, indicated. And we, you know, so the, the traditional answer to how you address the problems of uh, gas bill and gas price inflation would be to get the price of gas down, right? So you la allow international markets and natural gas to kind of rebalance and you get your price of gas down that provides cheaper bills for most people not everybody and it doesn't address uh, some of the more difficult um, uh, electrically heated thing uh, uh, housing stock or off gas grid but th th that that would be the traditional response that how we how we've done it for, for for decades so you know into that comes the idea of let's do a scandinavian model around sort of district heating so the question for me in that is um, is that the best way of delivering UK policy objectives on heat, given where we're starting from? Because we're not starting from Denmark in 1970 or 1975. We're starting from where we are now with a heavily invested national gas grid. So it's not obvious that the, the Scandinavian model is the one to follow for the UK, partly because the infrastructure cost of getting there will be extremely high. And that has, you know, that has to come out of either public or private uh, funding. Um, so, you know... I, it's not a straightforward um, kind of model to copy at all. Um, it's also, there's also a question of how much uh, building's heat demand are you going to have in 20 or 30 years' time if you get the efficiency right and you get the conservation right. So I think the, the ambition in SEEP is to link together um, energy efficiency and uh, heat supply, but they're actually kind of playing against each other because if you get conservation efficiency right, you don't need... To uh, the case for investment in new heat infrastructure isn't as strong as it would be otherwise. If you understand, there isn't there isn't that much demand for heat in the future as, as there would be. So I think we have to be quite careful about suggesting that we switch over the entire system of the way we we've provided heat over the last 50 years since we started 
doing gas, which is a very popular um, uh, solution for, for most people. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's some difficult economic and social uh, questions in, in, in that suggestion. So I think where we are, this is one of these for me where district heating is being looked at very actively by Scottish Government. There are some interesting, I think for new housing stock, it, it may well make sense in, in many areas. Um, but I think it's one of those where we really need to be careful uh, how quickly we want to kind of uh, push on this because there are suggestions that we go for citywide district heating schemes as part of you know uh, the next uh, few years of infrastructure investment. I think that, that needs to be very carefully looked at. Is, is the reason why people like their gas boiler so much that they don't trust a system that they don't have control over if it breaks down or don't have the ability or they... I mean, what is the reason that people um, think that yeah, way? Yeah, I, I mean, I was listening to some evidence on this. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have the evidence? Uh, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it's reliable, um, it's controllable, um, it, it, yeah, it's generally affordable, although that's been less of a, you know, I think, so that's been more of a problem uh, over the last few years. But um, um, I, th I think, yeah, the, Compared to where we were before, and I think that's where we kind of often get it wrong is that we don't recognise what we do well in the UK on energy. That you know, think about what how people were heating their, their homes 30 years, 40 or 50 years ago, and there's still some way to go in terms of the most efficient gas boilers getting into people's homes. So um, there are suggestions in some of the work that I've seen um, that the that the heat problem can be addressed. Um, through a combination of different technologies that it doesn't have to, have to be wholesale infrastructure kind of changeover because that does introduce a lot of extra costs in, 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 into you know, infrastructure spend and, and quite how that's paid for and uh, recovered. I think that's a big problem. Thank you. Um, Malcolm Kay wanted to come in. I agree with everything Mark says, but can I just add that I think the nature of the argument for district heating has changed a lot in ways that people haven't quite woken up to in the past few years, that the argument used to be to a large extent in terms of efficiency. I don't think that's a very strong argument. Modern gas boilers are very efficient. There's no, and that's one reason why people like them. There's no problem with them. There is, however, a new argument for district heating, which is actually quite a strong one in terms of flexibility. Once you've got a district heating system, you can use flexible heating sources. It's much easier to introduce low carbon sources. A lot of the Scandinavian district heating schemes, which are mentioned, have moved across to biomass. One can envisage a future in which, for instance, uh, when you have wind farms which are whirling away throughout the night, they can be used actually to create heat. We were talking about storage earlier as though it was all about storage of electricity, but actually, uh, if we're looking forward to the future, storing heat is much easier and much cheaper than storing electricity. It might be the better way to store energy rather than storing it in the form of electricity. So the advantage of a, a district heating scheme if it fitted in to some overall future strategy, was that it might provide this sort of flexibility and help to fit into an integrated overall um, energy system. Now, I would agree that no one's talking about retrofitting all big cities immediately, but there are a lot of commercial developments um, in all the cities in the, in the country which could easily use forms of district heating and cooling. There are a lot of new estates being built. There are a lot of ways in which you could gradually spread this sort of approach. Um, and I'm not really convinced that the behavioral, the social arguments are that strong. I mean, people in Denmark and Finland aren't that different from us. Um, provided you can get the right sort of district heating system, I don't see why they shouldn't be acceptable. Elizabeth Leighton. Um, yes, on the on district heating, I think, um, you know, generally agree with what's been said. I, I think the Scottish government has put a lot of emphasis on growing district heating, but let's keep things in perspective. I think not, not even they would suggest that we're going to move to a Scandinavian model overnight. You know, we're, we're talking about incremental, you know, slower change, which, but it's not happening fast enough even as it is, and it doesn't have the regulatory protections in place um, for consumers um, or operational standards in place. And so there is um, uh, several um, political parties and the government is committed to a Warm Homes Act and it's expected that regulation of district heating would be core to that forthcoming legislation. So some thinking needs to go into building on the district 
commission on um, dis sorry the expert commission on district heating which made specific recommendations about consumer protection operational standards and looking at a supportive policy context that would require connections where it is possible and appropriate for example what Malcolm was just talking about with you know connecting to new anchor loads of a new leisure facility for example and I think you know, on the behavioral issue people like their boilers because that's what they know you know, how many of us have seen, a, you know, been in a house that's connected to a district heating system? Probably none of us. Um, but what a great thing. You don't have to take responsibility for the boiler or for servicing it or replacing it. And so it's a, it's a different way of thinking about, about your heating system. So I think the, the forthcoming bill as an opportunity to put in the protections that need to be in place and also the supportive policy context to make it more attractive for private investors to come forward um, and invest in bigger schemes. Thank you. Um, Andy Whiteman wanted to come in with a question. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, yes, I want to ask a question and get the sense from um, witnesses about the challenges we face in this, because it seems to me that uh, not only is this quite a complex challenge to decarbonize energy systems, uh, but we're talking across energy systems, transport, uh, housing, as well as generation and distribution as well. So my question is, do we actually have the institutional capacity to do this? Because the kind of joined up thinking that's required across policy areas, the timescales that are involved, which cross parliamentary sessions, the need for the public and the private sector to work together, the fact that uh, some of the changes that are required are to European scale, some are to UK scale, uh, some are to Scottish scale, some are to local scale, um, I would be interested in any sense of the scale of this challenge and, and have we done this before and can we do it? I mean, I, I think of, I don't know, the challenge of reconstructing after Second World War. I mean, it feels like that kind of challenge um, and I'm not entirely convinced that the institutional capacity is there. And a specific question would be on the role of municipalities in this because we see across Europe a lot of innovation taking place in municipal government, uh, which traditionally prior to the 1940s, was obviously an innovator uh, here in the UK as well, but hasn't been in the last decades. Who would like to uh, respond to that first off? Malcolm Kay? I think, oddly enough, the UK has a good example of how to do it in the form of the Climate Change Committee which is providing expert advice, it's providing uh, recommendations to the government, those recommendations have always been accepted. We, we've got a structure there, except that that is a climate change oriented structure. I think one could envisage something similar in the energy sector. I know it's in some ways more political, but something which provided expert advice, um, but non-political advice, stretching over the longer term that was consistent with the climate change committees time scales and carbon budgets and so on so um, i think we're halfway there <coughs> i think the reason we haven't got any further of the way there is because there's still a very great ideological uncertainty at the top end of government about whether they believe in markets or not do you want markets to do this in which case you don't want any central guiding strategy you want to get prices right and then leave it to markets um, and I, I think that needs to be resolved one way or another. If you want to rely on prices to deliver this, then you have to take the sort of tax issues we were talking about earlier much more seriously. You have to decide what sort of signals you want to give, what, how regulation is going to ensure you get the right price signals and so on. If you don't want to rely so much on markets, then you do have to have a very clear forward strategy of the sort I've described coming from the sort of committee I've described which would give a basis for for investment which the government could then secure but at the moment I think we're in rather an uncomfortable limbo between these two situations where the government spends half the time that's the not the Scottish government I'm talking about the UK government here but I think the Scottish government may have a part in this as far as the Scottish part of it is concerned the UK government is spending half the time saying it believes that markets should be delivering it and the other half of the time saying but actually we want Hinkley and we want this amount of wind power and we want this amount of this and we want this amount of that and that leads to to rather a messy situation which it hasn't yet quite affected the other sectors it has to an extent with gas because the government has said both we want to leave gas to the market and but we're going to adjust the capacity market until we ensure that we get some more gas fired power stations built so you've got the same sort of um, uncertainty there about 
whether it wants markets or um, a, a central strategy. And I think um, it has to, at that level and at the Scottish level, decide one way or another on this. Which way forward is it going? Is there not always a tension between markets and government strategy? Well, indeed, you can certainly have both. And um, they, they're, they're, to an extent, doing it, for instance, through the feed-in tariffs, which are now competitive, through the capacity market, which is, is a market. The trouble is um, they got the wrong result from the capacity market the first time around. They got a lot of diesel generators built and a lot of old coal-fired power stations kept in place. The trouble with relying on markets is you get the outcome the market wants, which is the, the most efficient outcome in terms of the parameters you've set. And, and that's the sort of area where I think the government does need to decide. If, if, if it's prepared to accept the outcome of um, some sort of a market system, then you probably could uh, introduce efficiencies that way. Um, but if it's really not prepared to, then people are going to be very reluctant to invest if they think, well, the government will change its mind and say, that's not the result we want it. We're going to fiddle the rules of the game until we get some different result. Right, I think um, Stuart Noble wanted to come in. Yeah, yeah, I think on um, the, the capacity market, because there are some, some changes going through there and, and in terms of the result. Um, what they didn't want. I mean, we, we are actively working to try and level the playing field and the competition within in the capacity market. Um, th some of the results you are seeing are due to non-cost reflective charges within the system. Um, you know, Scottish Power are fully, fully supportive of embedded type generation, but um, it can't be left to non-cost reflective signals to drive that outcome because you won't get to efficient outcome at all. So. Um, the, the changes, we support the changes that the government have been made and, and we believe that, you know, you will see a, a more competitive outcome in the, in, the, in the next auction. I just wanted to qualify one of my points on Kruken as well. It, it does depend how much water it's got in the dam and seven hours is a running, but it can run a little bit more than that at the moment. The exact numbers, I don't have the hand, but my mental arithmetic tells me it's a little bit more than seven hours. Yeah, OK. Um, you say you agree with the government. Um, which government? I think as we're talking about sorry, the UK and sorry. the Scottish government. I, I agree with the changes that, 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 that Bay's deck, formerly DEC, have made to the um, uh, and the uh, work being done by um, the industry modification process itself. So, so we have an industry modification going through the system at the moment, which will uh, be in front of Ofgem for approval, um, aiming for some time in December on embedded benefits and how they uh, award small generators. Thank you. And Kirsty Berg? Um, yep. So, so your question was, is the challenge big and are we set up institutionally for it? Is the challenge big? Yes, absolutely. On the institutions question, it's, it's always a challenge to get different um, institutions to, to work together and, and look at the big picture. But I think there's some positive things here. So on, the f on flexibility, on, on trying to make sure we've got an energy system that can be efficient and, and flexible. The work that we are doing is very much joint with the, with the UK government. It's actually a joint programme of, of work. And we've been working very closely with the Scottish government as well over the last year to talk about what we see as the, the challenges to, to meet flexibility and understand where the Scottish government is coming as well. So, so we want to commit to make sure that this is a joint piece of work so that you know, we don't do something with one hand and the UK government does something on the other hand, so this is a joined up program. Can I also just pick up on the, the markets, um, the, the sort of markets versus regulation? Um, I don't know, there, there is no such thing as a, as a perfect market, it is, and in particular in the, in the energy industry, because there are a lot of rules about how, how things run. So I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples. So, so some of the rules are around how you charge for using the network. That, that isn't a market. You have to set rules for it, and and parties which are seen as market participants have to work under these rules. And what what we need to do as part of the flexibility work is is make sure that these rules are fair, in the sense that they do provide a level playing field and don't subsidise one technology over the other without us realising that this is happening. So it is complex, and we always have to think about right what what are the rules. Um, uh, uh, around this, and there are a number. An another area is again when we're talking about um, uh, allowing innovative and new business models in. So you could just say, right, let's leave it to the market. Anyone can come in, <laughs> develop their own model, supply whatever households they want. You, you don't want to do that. You want to encourage 
innovation, but at the same time, you want to ensure a level of protection for consumers and people who are going to be using this. And therefore, you set some rules around what suppliers are, uh, what market participants are, are allowed to do. And, and that is one of the challenges. That's a big policy challenge in this, getting that balance right. We talked about that this morning on, you know, allowing innovation, allowing the market to operate, but making sure the rules give a, a level playing field um, so that you can, you know, keep the costs down for consumers while we make this this transition. Okay, um, Rachel Money and then Elizabeth Layton. I just uh, wanted to kind of briefly come in and just say that I think actually there's a lot to be positive about in terms of Scotland's approach to um, this transition to a low carbon economy, and I think we have to be mindful of the fact that we're we're not doing this on our own. It's a global effort. Everyone is pulling in this direction. Um, and I think we can take a lot of heart from the fact that so many of us around the room are all certainly singing from the same song sheet. We're talking about energy efficiency, we're talking about using uh, low carbon sources, protecting the, the consumer. And I think when you look at Scotland's um, engineering history, our history in terms of innovation, we're still doing that and we're doing that at the most cost effective means. Uh, Scottish Renewables has been producing a number of reports uh, looking at how we can further reduce costs in terms of onshore wind. We have the Catapult <coughs> Centre down in uh, Glasgow looking at how we further reduce costs from, from offshore wind. And I think, again, trying to take advantage of these emerging markets with storage and keeping flexibility where we can. Um, and also thinking about the community element in this in terms of we've got very strong public support as well and I think we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't forget that and I think we've got a lot to be positive about and particularly with the energy strategy making its way um, hopefully next year I think again thinking about where does this committee's role come come into force I think seeing those draft energy strategies come through and how they you know looking at it in more detail and actually asking that question is it going to meet a lot of its its objectives across across the board To the um, Andy Whiteman's question about the role of muni municipal government, and I think it's a very it's a very good question because there are a lot of expectations being placed on on local authorities and more and more so on communities themselves and in, in helping to deliver this agenda, and yet I think there is a mismatch between that expectation and the cap capacity that's either in place or that they can afford to put in place. Um, there. Are many local authorities that are doing quite exciting things with setting up um, ESCOs, um, working either in renewable or low carbon generation and providing affordable energy to many of the vulnerable people in their communities. But they are, they're unusual, they're rare, and they're seen as very high risk. And so I think there does need to be, in developing these programs like the National Infrastructure Priority, some, some consideration of what capacity is needed at the local authority level and support to communities so that they can play their part because they, they often are the, those that know best who, who's vulnerable and needs help, what are the energy needs, how can they best be delivered in those areas. So I, I'd say yes, it is a gap that needs to be addressed. Um, thank you very much. At the other end of the scale, the, the Europe dimension. I'm just wondering if anyone's got any observations on, um, uh, obviously it's a time of uncertainty, but um, we need an energy union across Europe. Um, we have a hardwired market in terms of pipes and cables already. Um, any thoughts on how that might uh, develop in the future? Um, Mark Winscoe. Um, yeah, so there is quite a lot of. Uh, there's a, I think. I think we, essentially we don't quite know what the settlement is going to be uh, in terms of the, the UK access to the integrated um, internal energy market. So um, there are different models for for, for that. Um, I think it's potentially cost increasing. Uh, what's happened with the Brexit vote that we've already seen some kind of uh, suggestion that. Um, some of the large capital projects are going to have to pay more for their capital, that there is a kind of ad added element of uncertainty about that now. So um, I think, um, you know, the energy union um, was is, is just getting going, really. So there, there isn't um, a huge amount of kind of the UK 
getting out of in terms of uh, the, the, the large scale integration of, of, of uh, electricity networks, for example, that's, that's sort of envisaged for the future. I think what we have now is a lot of uncertainty about what the access to the market will be in the future. Um, UK will have less influence on the, the rules making up the internal energy market in Europe. Um, I think it would be, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of suggestions that the, uh, some of the cheapest ways to go about uh, energy transition is to do it on an international scale um, and that means you know having access to the internal market and being part of uh, an interconnected system I think that's going to be more difficult now uh, there's a lot of uncertainty but I think you know it, it, it's probably added costs have been introduced with the, the uncertainty that we've got um, yeah but is your view that it is still a vital part of sorting our energy needs regardless of how it might be more complex, might be more expensive or whatever it is, is it still an imperative that we develop integrated networks at that European scale? Uh, so I think this, it, it's quite difficult to say that because I think it becomes matters of political choice as much as uh, an imperative. So there, there might be a strong technical and economic imperative that if we want to do this most affordably, uh, the, the more integration the better, largely. And the UK was having to... Uh, construct interconnectors to, to bring it up to a, a more of a European level. The UK is quite an, still quite an island system, so it's, it, it, it is on a trajectory to be a lot more integrated, and that, but that was on the assumption that it was part of the energy union and the monies that go with that. So uh, there's European funding for in interconnectors, which the UK is still um, involved in at the moment, but I think, f I think for the future, um, um, you know, the, the, the sort of... Uh, I'm thinking a lot. A lot of these uh, issues, you know, there's, there's matters of political discretion which sort of aren't consistent with the the, the least cost pathway, and which one just has to sort of recognise where we are now. Unfortunately, is, is Norway not part of that whole debate or discussion as well in terms of interconnectors? Um, so I, Norway does have access to the internal market. Um, it's so it has the the the, the Norway. I think the Norway model is the model where. Um, rather like uh, lots of other discussions on, on sort of uh, labour and economy, that there is access but uh, uh, no input to the negotiations. So, the, 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 you know, the, it's sort of the fees still have to be paid to be part of, part of the market, but uh, the Norway doesn't have its... Uh, sit, doesn't sit around the table on things like market codes and the kind of strategic issues that uh, the UK has up till now been quite influential on. I don't know if other people might know more than that, but that's my understanding. Um, yes, Malcolm K. Briefly. Could just add that two of the current interconnector proposals for the UK, there's one with Norway, one with Iceland, neither of which is in the EU. Um, I, I strongly suspect that trade with Europe will continue in future, much as it has before, and that these sort of interconnectors will be built essentially um, if they make sense in the way that they have before. So I don't think it's going to make an enormous amount of difference from that point of view. The only problem at the moment is simply the uncertainty that there are four or five interconnected proposals, all of which are really on the, on, you know, being uh, put in the back burner at the moment until people know what's going to happen. But it's, it, it's unlikely that um, the, the, the trade between Norway and um, the European Union and trade between Switzerland and the European Union, which is very extensive in electricity and other um, uh, energy sources, isn't really impeded by the fact that they're not members. So I very much doubt in the long run it would make any great deal of difference. There is a short-run problem there. Thank you. Um, I'll take two questions. I think Dean Lockhart and Liam Kerr wanted to ask and I don't know if any committee member who's not asked so far, Richard Leonard, I think is also perhaps, the three of you could uh, perhaps pose your best question each and then see what, the, uh, what our guests uh, make of that in the 10 minutes remaining. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, convener. I'll do my very best. First of all, I refer to my register of interest in respect of a shareholding uh, in a smart smart meter company uh, which operates in England, uh, not Scotland. Um, I'd like to uh, elaborate possibly on, on the Brexit implications because it's front and central uh, to a lot of discussions across a number of sectors, uh, this one in particular. Um, uh, as I see it, Brexit cuts across um, a number of areas discussed today, including uh, EU regulatory 
requirements, targets on renewables and otherwise, the interconnector market we, we've just discussed. I would welcome thoughts from other guests as to both the immediate uh, impact of Brexit and, and the further term impact of Brexit going forward. Thank you. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, so my question is very specific, uh, almost certainly to Mike Tholen of Oil & Gas UK, uh, around the oil and gas industry and some of the difficulties that it's been facing. So, uh, firstly, the UK government cut tax on uh, the industry and that seems to have had a positive effect on production. We know that the industry has reduced its lifting costs significantly. Uh, so, what can the Scottish government be doing or what can we as a parliament be doing to support the industry through these difficult times, uh, specifically I have in mind things like decommissioning. Uh, how do we get it coming in at Dundee? How do we get it coming in at NIG? That sort of thing. Uh, and secondly, what can be done in the meantime with the workforce? We have a very highly specialised energy industry uh, with a workforce that uh, has suffered rather recently. Uh, I'm not readily persuaded that they can all be ported into renewables. Uh, I don't think that's happening at the moment. I don't think it will. I'm not persuaded that we can retrain them all into something else. So. Do you have a view on what is the solution to keep our talent in the UK, to keep our talent in Scotland, and how do we re-engage them in the short and long term? And Richard Leonard. Yep, this is the um, uh, Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, and so I'd like to broaden, uh, if I may, the, uh, the discussion. A few people have mentioned the supply chain, uh, the supply chain in gas boilers. Uh, I think Rachel mentioned the supply chain earlier on. And I just wondered, and in a sense this relates to the oil and gas industry too, um, where do you, do you think there will be an indigenous jobs dividend from some of the investments that you're speaking about? Uh, and uh, supplementary to that, um, if you're not sure, how do we steer it so that there is an indigenous industrial jobs dividend from some of the things we've been speaking about this morning? Right, perhaps we could allow Mike Tholen to come back on Liam Kerr's question. First of all, as Mike's not been part of the discussion up till now. Right, um, perhaps to bounce straight from Dean Lockhart's doing to Liam's, the Brexit thing, even from our own perspective, regulatory uncertainty long term and the ability to access and influence broader energy policy around Europe is vital to every part of the energy sector, not least my own as I'm sure the other, the other proponents around the table. Um, in terms of uh, the outlook for our industry and how the government, Scottish government can best help, the having tax changes, the tax changes that there have been only had a modest influence on the investments that have been going on because the production rise we have seen is mostly driven by investments over the last four or five years, some of which were when oil prices were high and taxes were high as well. The challenge going forward is to, to seize the efficiency wave that we have uh, and make sure that we are competitive for the future in a way that we have been competitive in the past. Uh, the uh, focus on uh, decommissioning is one element, but is only a small part of the bigger element of, of the uh, successful future for our industry, because with the resources we have around the offshore, uh, we need to keep investing as well as running the business, as well as indeed decommissioning those things which have reached the end of their useful life. So a tension between those things which investment is vital for. Uh, you touch on the supply chain and the capabilities of it. The capabilities within the decommissioning picture, we're trying to help inform the market more what the decommissioning outlook looks like. There's a lot of work going on with Scottish Enterprise on that. Uh, and uh, the, the Scottish Government has been uh, a very strong proponent of those skills. Uh, I think my challenge back would be, uh, as I mentioned to some of the committee earlier and in the informal session, uh, Norway, it's first and foremost a big exporter of oil and gas. Secondly, its skills in the oil fields, goods and services sector is its second biggest export. After that, you'll be amazed to hear it's fish. Uh, and, you know, so making sure that our economy is successful with its industrial capability and able to reach uh, a market of more than 100 countries that use those goods and services will be vital in the future. Uh, and we, we are leading the way in how we are adapting our business to mid-late life plus. Uh, and those skills mean that we can teach others how to do them, to do them well, and found them with Scottish jobs and Scottish technology. So that, that's, that's the path we're trying to walk. Thanks. Thank you. And um, Richard Leonard's question, I think possibly Elizabeth Layton wanted to come in on that. 
Um, yes, yeah, so it's nodding my head uh, vigorously because, uh, of course, one of the main arguments that we've made for the national infrastructure priority is that it would or could deliver jobs, and not just jobs where, like, say, another infrastructure project, a hospital is being built, or where the new fourth crossing is being built, but jobs in all of your, all of our communities that we would all benefit from that because you would have increased jobs, you'd have increased money in the local economy, reduction in fuel poverty, so less, you know, less people suffering from inequalities. So, so it's a real win-win and it's been estimated at, you know, having a sort of value for money or a benefit to cost ratio of two to one. Um, but it does mean that it has to be designed in a way that we're not going to repeat the mistakes of the past of energy efficiency programs where a lot of the jobs have been sort of flown in or shipped in from, from the south or from the central belt and so not the benefits not felt in rural areas. So it needs to be designed such that local jobs and supply chains are prioritized and there are examples of how that is being done in more recent programs. And the other factor that's really critical is that it's a multi-year commitment. So an infrastructure priority over, you know, 10 to 20, 10 to 15 years with multi-year commitment on the budget is absolutely critical or else your local plumber or your local electrician, they're not going to train up in some of these um, new, new skills that they will need because they're not sure will the job be there the following year. So with those elements in place, yes, we think 9,000 jobs a year all over Scotland, you know, what's not to like about that? Uh, Rachel Money. Um, just to, to come in on that point about supply chain, I think it's a really valuable question about how do you map the supply chain across the energy efficiency sector, low carbon transport, heat, electricity and storage and all these other emerging markets. Um, I do know Scottish Enterprise have done a fair amount of work in terms of mapping the supply chain with relation to offshore wind, but I haven't seen necessarily a supply chain map across this low carbon economy that we are that we're striving to um, to have. So I guess again my question would kind of be back to the committee of is there a way that that, that Scotland can take a, a greater role in that and mapping that supply chain and not only doing that but looking at where um, new opportunities are arising. And looking at actually how much we export in terms of our own intellectual property, there's some fantastic examples out there from uh, companies like Skure Energy working all over the world in terms of uh, putting their products into uh, projects um, internationally. And obviously examples like the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney using uh, innovation to, to drive that intellectual property and seeing the, that learning um, be pushed around the world, basically. Um, I think also we have to look at, in terms of number of jobs, the job statistics that we have um, for Scotland is around 21,000 people are employed in Scotland related to the renewable energy sector. We rely on getting those statistics from what was BIS, now B's, um, department down south. And I think, again, from Scottish Renewables' perspective, we'd probably quite like to see Scotland take a bit more ownership in terms of collating again what the value is in terms of job creation across this low carbon economy and ensure that we get those statistics that they're robust and they're produced annually as well. Currently I'm not sure if we're actually capturing all of that value um, and I'll also make a very brief point about also just trying to get really down to the nitty gritty in terms of the investment figures how much investment's actually been brought into um, the Scottish economy. Um, and I think we need to do a little bit more work in terms of really ensuring that we've got the, the best possible statistics on that. Um, but yeah, that's my point. Thank you. And perhaps um, just a last contribution from Mark Winskull, a brief contribution. Uh, so I, I think one, you can think about this in two ways. So energy as an input to the economy or energy as a source of economic growth and, and uh, other kind of uh, econo economic kind of policy objectives. So they are quite different and they can be kind of in tension at times. But I think there are kind of ways of, uh, sort of trying to get them to add, add up together. So I think one of the things is to encourage a whole system kind of view of energy, which includes uh, traditional energy as well as new energy and how, how you know, both of those uh, can be maintained to some extent going forwards. And, you know, um, at what point... Uh, 
do we have to think about a, a, a more of a transition of that traditional industry? One of the things that uh, I, I think one, one way into this is to think about um, in, industrial clusters, and I know there's some thoughts about this from um, dig, uh, keep, keeping heavy industry in central Scotland and thinking about things uh, in a more joined up way. And so there are opportunities here, I think, for Scotland on, on the CCS front, that there, there are ways of um, combining a, 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 a energy intensity with, with decarbonisation, which is a particular kind of Scottish opportunity given the uh, CCS interest. So I think keep going on, on that, um, as well as some of these more specific kind of growth areas. So I think this does need joining up in terms of traditional industry and sort of emerging new industry and uh, also the general cost of energy into the economy. So there's, there's different ways of, of getting into that. Thank you. Right. As well as we bring this session to a close, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses who have come here um, and spent time with us today. Thank you very much. We'll, I'll now suspend the meeting and we'll move into private session. Uh, so we'll have a few minutes just to allow the gallery to clear as well.